Dr. Gould, thanks for joining me, and uh, of course, congratulations on your recent wedding. Now, I'd like to ask you first of all, if you look back, how would you describe your journey as an e patient? Um, well, good morning. Um, well, if by e patient we mean engaged and empowered, then I've been all that for a very long time, like over 30 years. Um, and I would say that's thanks to a life threatening medical event when I was 20 and a chronic illness that was diagnosed in 1986. So those experiences really provided the impetus for me to learn more about my own health and wellness, my body, and uh, I was quickly plunged into all major sectors of the healthcare industry. So I had to learn that, um, both traditional and complementary medicine. Um, so that was my experience that kind of got me started. And then early on, I realized it was important to share what I had discovered and learned with other people, n not just those with similar health issues, but anyone who had gotten caught up in the very confusing and often very frightening world of medical care uh, delivered by, you know, individual physicians as well as uh, those based in hospitals. So, uh, you know, that, that's my journey, and I'm sticking with it. Now, there's obviously millions of patients online all over the world, all kinds of different disease areas. But what do you think makes someone like yourself really want to become a vocal champion for their disease and for other patients rather than just sit on the sidelines? You know, that's a great uh, question. In, in my situation, and I think uh, some of it is applicable to others, um, my training, I'm a sociologist by training, so my training as a sociologist, my experience as a college professor, I was a college professor for a decade and very committed to education, um, those certainly contributed to my passion about being a vocal champion. But we also have to uh, you know, uh, factor in my temperament. I'm kind of a gadfly, and I have a big mouth because I'm a New Yorker. Um, so I would say that the, the education, training, and experience uh, for me provided the credibility, uh, my temperament, and my deep desire to be of service is what motivated me. I think for others, that's similar in many cases, and I think for many of the e-patients, the other e-patients I talk to, they just become so fed up with the system and so discouraged that, and, uh, that they decide to take action. Uh, they become advocates for themselves, and then they realize that they need to be a service to others. Um, so I hate to say it, but a lot of the uh, what I see is that people become vocal champions because they're just disgusted. I wish I wish it was other, but I think that seems to be the major impetus for most people. Sure, sure. And when you look at your experience, and I guess also the experience of other people that you're engaging with. What have you seen are the main challenges for people who are perhaps newly diagnosed, they're trying to understand their condition, and indeed trying to come to terms with this? Well, you know, Paul, I see language and health literacy at the core of everything. Um, how is the diagnosis communicated? How is it received? So the main, main challenge for, for patients is getting past the confusion and then depending on the diagnosis, the fear that comes with any new diagnosis. Um, the world of online peer support uh, that has been there for decades, really. I mean, I was involved with an online health support group on CompuServe back in the mid-90s. Um, those online communities are now even more powerful because of social media, and that helps patients meet and overcome those challenges of fear. So you find people going on Twitter using the hashtag diabetes, I use the hashtag fibro. Um, I've seen people go on saying, I just got diagnosed with diabetes, help, um, and all sorts of information comes flooding in for fibro, which is a chronic illness that involves deep fatigue and can be very discouraging. I will, and this is only in the past year actually that I've gone very public with this, but I will go on Twitter and say, having a bad day, hashtag fibro. Anyone else? Um, and we'll get a flood of responses. Or if something's going on, there seems to be a correlation between my fatigue factor and changes in barometric pressure. Sometimes a diet thing will seem to trigger it. I'll go on Twitter and just say, 
anyone else just get slammed by soy sauce? <laughs> you know, hashtag mm-hmm. fiber. So uh, social media has made those uh, communities very visible and very active and, and very engaged, and that's, you know, that's very helpful uh, for the newly diagnosed and also those of us who have been uh, dealing with that. Uh, dealing with the diagnoses for a while. I think the main challenge for providers in the industry is providing education and information that's very easy to understand and that's very practical. I mean, the materials, whether they're in print or online, they need to speak to the concerns and fears and needs. And, you know, I I see materials getting closer every day uh, to fulfilling that. And I think social media has helped healthcare communicators become much more savvy about learning styles that it's not enough just to put out something in print or something that somebody has to read, but you know, people learn uh, from audio, visual materials, as well as just visual materials. So uh, I'm seeing a broader range of, of uh, communication uh, tools and tactics coming out, which I think is helping to reduce the early panic response of the newly diagnosed. And as you've talked about there, there's obviously a great focus at the moment on how the pharma industry, how healthcare providers are communicating to patients and using digital channels. But if we flip that around, there's obviously a lot that can be learned from listening to the patient. So what do you see as the biggest challenges specifically in terms of patients communicating back with healthcare providers and pharma? Right. Well, again, it's, it's a language thing. And as a sociologist, I, o- uh, I always zoom in on other variables as well, uh, age, sex, you know, race and ethnicity, socioeconomic status, all that shapes the way information is delivered and received. Um, some of the very early work, early being in the 70s, in the sociology of medicine on clinical interviews, underscored gender differences in how women and men provide medical information and how that can get gummed up when the physician is a man and the patient is a woman because women tend to be more relational when they describe their symptoms and the onset and the progression and men tend to be more linear. So, you know, we know all that stuff and now it's a matter of putting it into place. So, the big challenge for patients is understanding the way their provider takes in information, can receive information. Um, So, you know, that's one big challenge. I will ask at the beginning in my own case, and I just started with some new doctors because I finally got health insurance, but when I start with a new doctor, I say we need to have a conversation about communication. Um, how, How do you prefer that we communicate? Here's how I prefer to communicate. Um, I tell them that I'm over, you know, I'm a high communicator. They cannot give me too much information. I tell them my educational status. I tell them that I do consult Dr. Google and that I am going to go online. And if that's a problem for them, they need to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> the ones who don't get taken aback remain my doctors. The ones who run screaming from the exam room <laughs> do not. Um, but I think the challenge for, you know, the other challenge for patients, especially those with, you know, painful and debilitating chronic conditions, is we need to communicate our needs in a way that conveys the urgency and our personal knowledge and experience without coming across as combative or shrill. Now, I personally tend to fail at this a lot <laughs> because I can go into combative pretty quickly, sure. um, and that's, you know, it really depends on my pain level. I try not to. I try to use humor. And, in fact, I recently told the doctor, just last week, I told the doctor, I said, you, what you need to know about me is that humor is my default for pain. The more pain I'm in, the more I'm going to be cracking jokes. And she got it. She said, oh, okay, I know your type. I said, yeah, you'll be laughing a lot, but just know I'm in a lot of pain. She said, okay, got it. So, You know, I know how to communicate that way. I've also had this condition for many years. I'm used to it. I know how to communicate it. People who are newly diagnosed and just learning about their own condition, it's not that easy. So I think we need to create um, ways to encourage patients and also encourage uh, physicians to have that conversation about how do we communicate uh, what works and what doesn't. So it's really as much about 
how it's communicated as what is communicated. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't it actually doesn't even matter what's communicated. If it's not communicated uh in a way that can be received, you may as well hand someone a black a blank page or just be talking to yourself because it's going nowhere. It's not getting in. And and I you know, that's the other reason for especially with e patients and this is big in the e patient community, um the advice I always give that I actually do not always follow myself is bring an advocate with you. Bring someone who can take notes and listen, uh, especially if you're receiving a diagnosis. Okay. So my final question would be, with, with all that in mind, obviously different groups are still very much finding their way when it comes to online communication. So how do you see the patient, healthcare provider, and indeed pharma relationship evolving in the future? Now, would it be too saucy to say I don't see it evolving, but I hope it does? I mean, I mean, if you're asking me, which, which you are, obviously, I, I strongly, strongly urge pharma folks at every level, from drug development through marketing, sales and distribution, to realize that the universe of key, key opinion leaders needs to be expanded to embrace patients. I spent quite a few years writing materials, creating materials, both print and online, for the pharma industry. And I was, you know, years ago, they would, we'd listen to maybe two or three focus groups of patients and caregivers, if that's what the materials were, that was the audience the materials were targeting and considered it done. I don't think that's sufficient. Um, I think those of us who have these conditions and those of us who care for people with these conditions do end up knowing much more about what works, what doesn't, what hasn't, and what won't. And we need to, you know, we need to be asked. We need to be invited into these conversations. The KOLs are not just the doctors. And uh, you know, and while you're at it, pharma compensate us for our expertise, just like you do the KOLs. You know. And uh, I'd like to see uh, pharma, in particular the pharma industry, invite uh, patients uh, to professional conferences to share what we know and to help uh, pharma broadcast information via social media. So, for example, um, inviting the key social media e-patients to a conference to live tweet it or blog about it I think it would be a very smart move for pharma because there's uh, there's a kind of a suspicion and um, a distrust among patients for the pharmaceutical industry in general. Um, and I think if we if pharma can get more advocates, you know, patients who say, "Look, you know, I am participating in this." That's to the best. I mean, I worked on an Alzheimer's for you know, decades ago. I worked on an Alzheimer's project for a couple of years. And I, as a result of working on that as the writer and the editor and the strategist, I came away with a tremendous amount of respect for researchers uh, and, and the marketers in the pharmaceutical industry and the, and the company I was uh, doing the work for. And people would say to me, oh, my God, you're working for the evil empire. And I'd say, not so fast. These people are dedicated, they care, they understand, they want it to be better. Um, I think uh, e-patients, we can help pharma achieve those goals, but you've got to ask us. Well, I hope as there are more and more vocal and active e-patients like yourself that pharma will start to embrace some of these ideas. So, well, um, it's a... You know, it's a challenge because here's what happens, you know, you know, looping back to the other point is that people get so frustrated. You know, it's really hard. It's really difficult to communicate to the industry and to um, practitioners without getting very cranky and being combative and getting yeah. shrill. Which is why I think pharma and the rest of the healthcare industry would do well to go to e-patients, to go to people who are not newly diagnosed, because that person has already gone through the life cycle of this isn't happening to me, you know, the, the fear, the denial, the anger, and then coming into this is my life, how can I make it better for myself and for other people? So I think where you have someone in that cycle of um, health and wellness 
um, makes a big difference in the way the information is going to be communicated. Does that make sense? It does make sense, yeah. Um, And with those thoughts, I'll say, Dr. Gould, thank you very much. It's been great to hear your perspective. My pleasure. PharmaForum.com is the dynamic online information and discussion portal for the pharmaceutical industry.